Dr. Martin Shapiro. Uh, Martin is Canadian, as I made uh, reference to. He got his uh, bachelor's and his MD at McGill University, and then stayed on in Montreal to do his residency in internal medicine at the Royal Victoria Hospital. And then he moved to UCLA uh, for the old RWJ Clinical Scholars Program and stayed at UCLA for a very long time. Uh, he uh, got uh, his MPH there and a PhD in history, uh, went on to be a very successful researcher and for his last 25 years at UCLA was the division chief and the head of their T32 uh, training program. Um, Martin um, is a truly great scholar um, and researcher, what, perhaps best known, uh, but it's by far not everything he's done for a landmark and very important study on a population-based uh, 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 study of the experiences and the care received for those with HIV in um, sort of the middle part of the epidemic uh, and uh, funded by ARC, but has done a variety of different work. He's also a dedicated clinician and clinical educator. Um, and um, less uh, five years about, He's been uh, Professor Emeritus at uh, Cornell University and working on the book that is recently published that he's going to talk about today. I am one of many individuals who personally have a great debt to Martin. He was my mentor uh, on so many things, clinical. He was my first uh, uh, ward attending. He was... Uh, frequent attending of mine in clinic and what I learned to him about being uh, a caring and humane and conscientious provider. He uh, was my mentor on my senior resident research project, which got published in The Lancet, on my um, RWJ clinical scholars projects, which had two publication annals and one in New England Journal. And I say that not to brag about me, is that I was a terrible writer. Martin is one of the best writers and editors that I have met throughout my career. And that's a plug for his book, which is written <laughs> in this very ambitious but entertaining way on the US healthcare system. It's gonna be interesting to see how he deals with this topic today in which the book takes everything from medical education to public health, aspects of culture, communication, organization, financing, prioritization, and misprioritization of a non-system. And he's going to try to talk to us not just about what those problems are, but what are the big vision changes that might move us further to what he's dedicated his professional life to is to try to make healthcare more humane, effective, and just. So thank you, Martin, for sharing uh, time with us. It's great. Thank you very much, Rod, for your nice uh, comments. And of course, you've set me up uh, to fail. You've, you've said that I'm going to describe all the problems in healthcare, all the contributors to those problems, and all the things that we uh, might do about them uh, in the next uh, 50 minutes or so, which is uh, reminiscent of Woody Allen's line about uh, reading War and Peace in 20 minutes, uh, it concerned Russia, but uh, I'm going to do my best. Um, so I'm, I'm really delighted to be here, and I have lots of uh, 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 connections to um, wonderful people at the University of Michigan, and I just want to mention a few. Uh, Rod, who introduced me, who worked with me as a resident and a fellow, and even for a little while when he was on faculty at Michigan. Eve, who stayed on with us briefly after fellowship at UCLA, then left, not, I suspect, because she uh, didn't think she would thrive at UCLA, but because it created too much tension with her parents who were professors at USC for her to be at the competing institution. Um, 
Steve Bernstein, who was another fellow at UCLA and um, uh, who I got to know very well. Steve Katz, who worked with me as a resident before heading off to do his fellowship in Seattle. Uh, Larry McMahon, who uh, outlasted me as a division chief. Um, uh, we uh, talked at times about how long this ought to go on. I think I suggested that it was reaching the point where it was him, me, and the Castro brothers. Um, and Joel Howell, um, physician historian, um, uh, my brother from another mother, if I can say that, and um, with, with, with whom I consulted one, one day in London when you guys were about to be uh, site visited for the Clinical Scholars Program. And I gave him some suggestions on how you might secure that, uh, uh, that slot in the program, and uh, which hopefully was, was helpful. Um, I love all these people and uh, greatly admire so many others uh, of you who are on the call today. Well, I gave, uh, um, I guess I'm supposed to, uh, oh, um, there we go. Okay. Uh, I am supposed to let you know that I have no conflicts of interest to declare other than that I used to wear a button that proclaimed that criticism is an act of love. So I gave grand rounds at Michigan a couple of decades ago. And in so doing, I made some comments that might well have been construed as disrespecting uh, the men's basketball team. Uh, no one uttered a word of pro protest, but they did give me a Michigan tie. And I'm wearing that tie today uh, in penance for my prior sin. I'm a fan of UCLA, and we still have season tickets to women's basketball there, even after moving away. Uh, accordingly, I have never liked the Big Ten, and I have preferred schools in the Pac-12, which was the Pac-8 when I moved there. Now to my great sorrow, UCLA and a team that must not be named uh, have decided to join the Big Ten, which will become a big and not so sweet 16. What am I to do? Um, as the big whatever spreads its tentacles from sea to shining sea, We're trying it, to... it becomes uh, an expression of America's manifest destiny, the annihilation of all else, and the belief that bigger is always better. But I guess I'm getting off track, because what could any of this have to do with healthcare in America? When my wife was offered a job uh, at Mount Sinai Medical School in New York, I gave up my position as division chief at UCLA and had an opportunity to think about what I could do next. She reminded me that for years I'd been threatening to write a book about American healthcare and I decided to do that. I entered academic medicine, like many in general medicine, with the belief that we would do research that would change medicine. We have fallen far short of our aspiration. And with this book that I've written, I hope to engender serious discussion about how we can get back on the right track. In writing it, I came to realize that to reach audiences who don't dwell in health policy, I, I had to make it concrete with lots of stories about clinical medicine and education and research and find a way to show how problems are linked. I also knew that I had to link it to evidence and to social theory across multiple disciplines. I learned a lot and the process was humbling. This talk includes elements that are intended largely for medical audiences who are undoubtedly more skeptical than uh, those of you who are in other disciplines, but I'd like you to see how I'm presenting uh, these ideas to others. It's my hope that if pre-med students and physicians in training were to read the, the book or hear the talk, it might shake some of them out of their career-driven complacency and complicity. So today I'll give you an overview of the case I try to make. This is a great time to be in medicine. It's a time of scientific breakthroughs, an age of exploding knowledge of mechanisms of disease, an epic of extraordinary profits for healthcare businesses, a season of life-saving medical interventions. It's the spring of personalized medicines. And indeed, some believe we're all going to approach immortality. But is that the whole picture? It's also a time of clinical neglect, an age of blissful ignorance towards chasms in health. 
and an epic of personal bankruptcies due to medical debts. A season of choosing whether to pay for health care or other basic needs. The personalized medicines are extremely expensive. And it's the winter of avoidable deaths for many whose problems lack priority. And certainly, those who are facing premature death aren't thinking at all about immortality. Why is it so hard to fix health care in America? If we're, if we're to make more headway, I believe we need to think about it in a different way than we have up till now and act accordingly. So what's rotten in the state of health care? As you know, disparities in access and health, high costs and poor outcomes are among the most, among the most prominent features of dysfunction. And I won't dwell long on the well-characterized manifestations of our healthcare system's dreadfulness. A lack of insurance for many, even after passage of the ACA, and underinsurance under -insurance for even more. Our health expenditures far exceed those in other countries as a percentage of GDP. Back before 1970, the US wasn't such a spendthrift. Expenditures were comparable to those in Canada relative to uh, GDP. That changed when Canada adopted its national health plan. Over that period, uh, the US has steadily fallen behind other countries with advanced economies and life expectancy. And over the last century, life expectancy in almost all countries has improved, but less so in the US, which is at about 78.9 before the pandemic, than in most advanced countries, lagging by three to five years. And that has gotten even worse uh, uh, with COVID. So why has it been so hard to pull the right levers and create policies to solve these problems? I believe that the problems are multifaceted and go well beyond the tried and true targets of most policy proposals and health services research. The ways in which the various groups of actors conceptualize health and healthcare, pursue their interests and perceived needs and interact based on these conceptualizations create impediments to a system that is rational, just, and efficient. Let's look at the group of groups of actors that I argue all stand in the way of equitable, efficient, and effective care. These are practicing physicians and their organizations, medical schools and universities, corporate providers of medical care, including hospitals, health systems, medical groups, dialysis, nursing home, and pharmacy companies other corporations in the health sector, manufacturers of pharmaceuticals, biologics, machines, devices, and information systems. Of course, health insurance companies and investors, but also scientists and scientific organizations, the government, employers, and patients, their families, employee groups, and many community organizations. I believe that Three phenomena shape the circumstances and the experience of healthcare in contemporary society. The treatment of healthcare and health itself as commodities by all actors within and without the system. The consciousness of the various actors, their attitudes, values, perceived needs, expectations, interests, and capacities, which condition their conceptualization of health and healthcare and much of their behavior in relation to it and the nature of the communication and the relationships uh, among, uh, 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 among these groups of actors, which reinforce existing arrangements and impede change. Real life cases make these issues more than mere abstractions. Luis was a 23 year old man from Central America with a mild learning disability who lived with his parents. He had congenital immune deficiency and required immunoglobulin infusion since birth. Early on, he developed hep C infection from an infusion. When Luis was seven, his parents moved to the US and he came to my teaching hospital for his care. We took care of him for 15 years. Meanwhile, his hep C progressed to end-stage liver disease. The liver transplant service declined to list him for transplant, saying he had no insight about his illness. Uh, and his parents both worked, so he did not take his medicines consistently. We believe that were he transplanted, he wouldn't reliably take the medicines needed to prevent rejection. My residents and I sat down with the family to discuss his situation in Spanish. It turned out that Luis had never missed a single dose of medicine. Because of his illness and disability, 
his loving parents had chosen to work different shifts. So he was never alone if he needed medicine or became ill. He also did understand his illness and the importance of taking his medicines. At his bedside, we couldn't help but notice the family dynamics. His parents were totally devoted to keeping him well. Without the procedure, he would die. We shared this information with the liver team. They pointed out that Luis was an undocumented immigrant and that while coverage had been arranged for his routine care, he did not have insurance to pay for the procedure. I spoke to the transplant surgeon, noting that we'd cared for him for 15 years. He said he would waive his fee, that we would have to get the hospital to cooperate as well. The associate director of the hospital, which ran annual surpluses of $200 million or more per year, told me that it was a considerable expense to do a transplant, and that even if they waived all charges, the patients would be unable to pay for his, pay for his transplant meds in the long run. I implored him to pursue it and see if Medi-Cal, California's Medicaid, or others would provide some coverage given his long time living in the country. He claimed that they tried, but Medi-Cal refused. We were incensed, but the hospital's decision was final. Our only hope was to get him to another hospital that might try harder. Fortunately, a hepatology fellow who was equally frustrated contacted other programs in the region, and one of them agreed to take Luis. We learned that they were able to get the procedure authorized and he was placed on a transplant waiting list. Luis's story illustrates many salient issues. Notwithstanding an apparently acceptable outcome, the system failed him. Even after we showed he'd be able to take his meds consistently, that his parents were very supportive, that his time in the country was a mitigating circumstance, Luis would have been sent home to die. In American healthcare, some lives are cheap. In cases like Luis's, the problem isn't only tunnel vision of some doctors who failed to collect vital information, but also the priorities of health systems, including America's so-called best hospitals, a far from acceptable quality of communication with uh, patients and their families also can stand in the way of patients getting the care that they need. My main point today is that fixing healthcare is so very difficult because of the interplay of consciousness, the commodified world of healthcare, and the toxic relationships and problematic communication that pervade health care. A resolution of these challenges requires acknowledging this interplay and addressing it. Let's consider the various group of actors in turn. Major health systems include academic and non-academic ones, and those that are for profit and those supposedly not for profit. The behavioral distinction between these types of organizations is far from clear. They contribute to the problem in a number of ways. Notably, they are interested in sales. Early in my career, my department had a retreat. The keynote speaker was a senior executive of Henry Ford Hospital. He regaled us with an account of their business strategy and how they increased sales. He then paused and said, which you refer to as hospital admissions and outpatient visits. That was clarifying. Far too often, the business strategy of health systems is market, uh, maximize market share of covered lives, as they call them, maximize reimbursement for services, minimize risk, that is poor people with Medicaid or no insurance, especially those needing lots of care, contract with healthy populations, develop and promote lucrative product lines, prioritize expensive procedures, make deals with industry, strive for nine-figure surpluses, reward executives with seven to eight figure salaries of which 30% nationally uh, are performance based bonuses. Among other corporate uh, 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 corporations in the health sector, the producers of goods are also interested in sales. They're in the business of inducing demand. Pharma and the biologics advertise shamelessly to patients and providers convincing the former that their products will extend life or improve its quality without regard to how much or at what cost. And they raise their prices when they can, often recruiting academic economists to justify exorbitant so-called price points, extend patents with minor modifications, so-called evergreening, restrict competitions and struggle mightily to prevent negotiation of prices. You may have seen the New York Times article about AbV uh, a week or two ago, uh, and how they garnered $122 billion using such strategies. Equipment manufacturers pressure medical groups to buy their products by letting it be known that uh, competing clinical sites have done so. 
They fight hard against taxes on their products. The market for information systems is an oligopoly in which pricing is prohibited for small practices. They increase the cost of care and the work of the provider for benefits that may or may not be forthcoming. The health insurance industry sees single payer uh, as an existential threat and fiercely resists any uh, expansion of public coverage while prodding allies in government to privatize the more lucrative components of existing public programs. They also add to problems with the current system because to maximize revenue, they minimize risk and too often by denying coverage for procedures or offering products with large co-pays and deductibles. They add greatly to administrative costs. Their co-pays, deductibles, and denials are an enormous burden, saddling many with insurmountable medical debt. Other corporate elements like nursing homes are motivated to maintain their revenue streams. As for investors, hedge funds have moved aggressively into the health sector, particularly in the last decade seeking to inflate apparent value through maximizing billing uh, and cutting uh, corners. They then sell at a large profit. Their level of public spirit and spiritedness might be uh, uh, comparable to that of Daniel Day-Lewis's character Plainview in the film, There Will Be Blood. There are many wonderful idealistic physicians, but practicing clinicians in their professional societies have economic interests that are quite obvious. The payment system reimburses procedures far better than evaluation and management. Inevitably, procedural specialties resist redistribution of income to cognitive ones by occupying up to 70% of seats on the RVU update committee, which advises Medicare on fees. They often produce guidelines that justify their activity, minimize risk by optimizing insurance type, and run the till as long as they can. UCLA residents used to joke that cardiologists uh, there had only two indications for invasive cardiac procedures, lub and dub. So everyone with a heartbeat met the requirements. The way in which the health system pays for services shapes the ways in which physicians practice. As you're all aware, the income differences between procedural and cognitive fields are stark and in fact have grown since the relative value scale was implemented in Medicare. At the same time, um, uh, doctors were not selected into medical school primarily to be empathic, caring, and altruistic. Many physicians handle uncertainty poorly, are not well-trained to limit care, are more comfortable with narrow tasks like procedures than building relationships with patients. Accordingly, the choices that many make of specialties are driven by efficiency of income generation. Communicating effectively with patients is not well rewarded and often is actively avoided. David was a medical student doing his third year clerkship in internal medicine. He was very smart and highly motivated. I was the attending physician on the ward team. His knowledge of disease and its treatment was at a very high level. He interacted extremely well with members of his team and with the nursing staff. He was terrific with patients, sensitive, open, caring, and committed. He obviously loved what he was doing. I shared my impression with him, and I told him that I believe he'd be an outstanding resident in internal medicine. He told me that he loved the rotation and could imagine doing that. Um, but he also told me he'd been advised by other students not to go into internal medicine. Quote, your test scores and grades are too good. It would be a waste, unquote. They were saying that his level of medical school performance would qualify him for a higher paying specialty. Nonetheless, he promised to think about what I'd said. As you can see here, uh, the proportion of residency positions filled by US medical graduates bears a linear relationship to specialty incomes. Several months after our conversation, David came by my office and asked if I'd write a letter of recommendation for him for residency, and I was happy to provide one, but disappointed to learn that he'd chosen to go into anesthesiology. It's likely that David will be a terrific anesthesiologist, but his awareness of what it meant financially was, in a sense, a corrupting influence upon his career decision. Why does society not value so-called cognitive specialties more than it does? Such work is no less complex and demanding and no less life-altering for patients. 
I think part of the explanation is that we do a poor job of getting that message out. I can relate some illustrative stories in this regard, uh, many of which I have in the book. Um, a patient who needed constant coaching and repeated discussions of evidence and emotional support to stick with treatment for his Hodgkin disease. A person who was dying and in pain, but needed to hear from a physician whom he trusted that it would be okay to end active treatment. A patient with severe hypertension and serious mental illness that made it hard to adhere to treatment and show up for appointments, who needed a doc who would stick with her and keep her alive. A patient who was dispirited by multiple morbidities and needed her doctor to manage her complex regimen, but also to keep her spirits up. We all have much that we can share about the value of what we do. We need to find better ways of communicating that. How about educational institutions? Universities and medical schools have considerable interest in the status quo and are part of the problem. Medical school admissions are limited almost entirely to those with great GPAs and test scores and pay little attention to values and ability to empathize and communicate effectively. Not surprisingly, the great majority of those admitted have studied the biological and physical sciences and related disciplines and overwhelmingly represent the, uh, those from privileged backgrounds and underrepresent Blacks and Hispanics. Medical, medical schools do a poor job of identifying students with commitment to social betterment that are more than window dressing on their applications. The undergraduate curriculum is science-based and biologically reductionist. Humanities and social sciences are at best an afterthought. The white coat ceremonies on entry are an exercise in triumphalism for people who've accomplished nothing yet, but have been told that they've arrived. Students go through a well-described negative socialization and loss of idealism that medical schools do not show enough interest in arresting. Once selected, students don't learn nearly enough about how to relate to patients and next to nothing about ethical obligations and social responsibilities. Some who arrive purportedly intending to follow in the footsteps of Mother Teresa rapidly decide to pursue the highest paying specialties. Student debt does not preclude eventually living in comfort, but provides a rationalization for those decisions. In postgraduate and clinical training, there are many wonderful clinical teachers but it's the exception, not the rule, when faculty model the kind of judicious, evidence-based application of technologies and commitment to diverse populations that might make America less exceptional. Again, there's little exposure to the humanities and social sciences, few opportunities to address doctors' personal challenges that stand in the way of effective relationships with patients, and little effort to assure that they're able to communicate effectively with patients. Some institutions try hard to provide positive outpatient experiences, but in many programs, they're famously awful. Residents who are pressed for time are assigned patients whom the faculty often don't want to see themselves. These features of the training, as well as the greater attention given to developing procedural skills rather than effective communication, uh, promote choices of procedural careers. Clinically, medical schools, um, are no less interested than the private sector in generating revenue by favoring good insurance, maximizing market share and profits, and marketing lucrative product lines and miracles. The health of the public is not a priority beyond the occasional lecture on social aspects of medicine that students might view online um, at double speed while multitasking. Practices are uh, typically segregated by insurance type. As with their teaching hospitals, academic practices, business plans reflect the priority of revenue generation, grow market share to maximize reimbursement, minimize risk, run the till. This is the so-called hidden curriculum. Students learn these lessons, lessons very well and grow up to emulate the practice patterns and values of their faculty. When I entered medical school, my uncle commented that I would have a choice between figuring out how to make a lot of money and how to best serve humanity, and that on the basis of my choice, people could judge my worth as a human being. That was a provocation, but it was also a gift. I still ask myself if I'm doing enough. 
many medical students and residents would benefit from such provocation. In terms of research, almost all medical school research funding comes from the federal government and industry. Uh, medical schools actively seek revenue from patents and royalties. The priority of maximizing such funding as well as grants and contracts affect hiring decisions. Social scientists and humanists don't bring in any patents and not nearly as many grants, so relatively few are hired limiting intellectual diversity in medical schools. Promotion is driven by funding and publication count, often of empirical studies, and rarely as much consideration given to the importance or challenges of social and community-based research uh, in hiring and promotion decisions. In thinking about science, it's worthwhile to consider Robert Merton's characterization of its ethos. He identified four components, universalism, it's subject to verification, anyone can contribute, Communalism, fi uh, the findings of science are products of collaboration and assigned to the community. The ethos is incompatible with technology defined as private property. Disinterestedness, which is objectivity about the outcome, and organized skepticism, uh, uh, which is the suspension of judgment and detached scrutiny of beliefs. Does this ethos characterize medical research today? Not entirely. Basic scientists tend to be excited about discovery. They're not really educated about societal context or social responsibilities of scientists. Since the passage of the Bay Dole Act in 1980, uh, uh, patents uh, can be lucrative uh, for scientists and for universities, along with large grants and contracts. For some, they're a consummation devoutly to be wished. And these priorities are apparent to students and affect their attitudes towards what's important in science. In terms of clinical research, obviously it can be invaluable, but when funded by industry, uh, payments are generous, but priorities may often be those of industry. Uh, intellectual freedom may be quite limited. In terms of late translational and policy research, like researchers like many of us, most tend to genuflect before the status quo in terms of healthcare organizations. And few studies look at substantial transformation, most focus on small changes and limited uh, populations. Um, to paraphrase uh, California politician Jeff Unruh, who ran unsuccessfully for governor against one Ronald Reagan, his famous axiom was mother, uh, money's the mother's milk of politics. Well, it's also the mother's milk of academic research and the NIH is the source. So when we think about where they dispense this milk, look at their mission statement in part, to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health, lengthen life and reduce illness and disability. And its programs are designed to improve the health of the nation by conducting and supporting research in the causes, diagnosis, prevention, and cure of human disease. Uh, it's clear that they don't treat all aspects of this mission statement equally. Scientific organizations and funders such as the NIH keep promising miracles as a justification for increasing uh, their budgets for research. Uh, they relentlessly pursue molecular explanations and that affects the practice of medicine, encouraging attitudes towards disease as being largely asocial. It influences public perceptions as well. They produce a narrow vision of what science could be, promulgating a flavor of the decade to keep money flowing their way, and certainly not towards other kinds of research that might have a larger impact on the health of the population. And of course, they fiercely defend their share of the research budget. When I wrote my first R01 grant proposal, an HIV outcome study, I got an excellent score, but it wasn't funded. When I spoke to the project officer at NIAID where I submitted it, he told me not to resubmit there because the director did not consider such research to be his responsibility. He told me that I should uh, rather uh, submit to AHRQ, uh, from which I eventually did get some funding. Well, uh, here's a breakdown of the nearly $50 billion NIH budget, along with those of ARC and PCORI. 
some of the large institutes do support some HSR and behavioral research, but for many of them, uh, such support fluctuates wildly. And some and others that have supported it traditionally, when there is a change of directorship as occurred at NIMH several years ago, uh, there is a substantial reduction in the level of support provided. Others essentially never support such research. A few consistently do, but most of those have budgets uh, comparable to about 1% uh, or even less of the NIH budget. Government, which can be part of the solution, is often part of the problem. In the case of the US federal government, they avoid policies that necessitate raising taxes. They're susceptible to corporate and interest group pressures. They're reluctant to limit care and offend any constituency. They ineffectively regulate the FDA, Medicare fees, and insurance products. They overpay for procedures compared to cognitive services. Their policies promote specialization. Uh, and they prefer moonshots, typically asocial and biological ones, rather than society-wide programs that might do more good. Our patients and their families, the innocent victims and all, victims and all this, I think not. Although many suffer the consequences of the behavior of other actors, but just as the scientist, the clinician, the pharmaceutical company, and the health system see health care as a commodity, so too do many patients. They want their share of the goods. Of course, many would prefer not to pay for it when it costs, uh, when it consumes 18% of the GDP. Who'd want to work seven and a half hours to pay for their medical care each week? Um, they, but they want the blood test, the scan, the bed in the ICU for their family member. And beyond that, many treat life as well as a kind of commodity, wanting more days, weeks, months of life, whatever the cost or consequences for others. There is not more thought of the common good among the public than among those working in the health sector. Why is that? And I believe in part it reflects a world in which almost everything is commodified, in which autonomy is unmediated by concern about dire consequences for the health of the public, um, in which some people feel entitled to get whatever they want, and in which many people often are not well connected to others and are replete with loneliness, insecurity, dissatisfaction with life in general, are beaten down by the world. They may come to the healthcare setting looking for solace, comfort, companionship, validation, a heart that's open to them in the way that the larger world is not. And unlike those demanding care out of entitlement, who often get what they want, these individuals encounter professionals who are not equipped to give them what they need. And their beliefs and attitudes may well be shaped by a government pro promising moonshot cures, a medical profession that doesn't know how to set limits, a scientific establishment that holds out the promise of conquering diseases that afflict society, lack of clarity from government about what limits are reasonable, and dogma from some religious leaders about when life begins and how it should end. Robert Bella and his colleagues' wonderful book, Habits of the Heart, provides useful insights. In part, they say that uh, American individualism has become an autonomy dissociated from uh, meaningful societal integration, damaged by destruction of subtle ties that bind people together, leaving them frightened and alone. Many abandon any notion of finding meaning in relation to society as a whole, and in particular in the idea of the common good. When education becomes a, an instrument for individual careerism, it cannot provide uh, meaning or civic culture. There's a fractured imbalance between individualism and communitarianism. Underlying the actions of all the actors are the values and consciousness of society as a whole outside of the health sector. These include acquisition, exploitation, inequity, lack of communal concern, mistrust, atomization, lack of fulfillment, greed is good, poverty is weakness, decline of religion as a source of support, failure of public discourse to address these issues. And in healthcare, this manifests both in relation to uh, the economic and political behavior of the actors, but also in terms of their inner lives. 
Healthcare is highly commodified and health and life as well. Everyone wants their piece of the $3 trillion pie. I guess it's bigger than that now. Some actors induce demand and, relate and raise prices. Others seek greater market share of people with good insurance and market lucrative products uh, lines to them. Some run the till and never say no to a patient or family member. Some are interested in inventions that will enrich them, seeking royalties and consultation fees and starting companies. Patients are complicit. They want their share of the commodities of care, health, and life. All of these groups are pushing the healthcare system to do more. On the other hand, uh, insurers, the government, and employers, each in their own ways and for their own reasons, often want to limit care and its costs and coverage in ways that are not necessarily consistent with optimal health. Only the public sector providers and other clinics for the poor are trying to do the right thing, albeit uh, with inadequate resources. When care is commodified, there's a disincentive to spend time talking to patients, relating to them, getting to know them, caring for them. There's an incentive to do more, sales, pacemakers, new medicines, uh, imaging studies, lab tests, path services, hospitalizations, surgeries for at best marginal indications, excessive consultation leading to unnecessary testing, higher co-pays, costlier insurance exacerbating disparities, and needless consumption of some resources such as ICU beds, limiting others' access to care they need. At the same time, there's little time and few resources to address social determinants of disease and the context in which people experience disease and treatment. And there's di diversion of resources from other societal needs, such as social services, education, and infrastructure, uh, which could do more for health, but which the US spends a lot less on relative to other societies. But Commodification is not the only problem with healthcare, and addressing it, although necessary, will not be sufficient. Um, oh, I skipped, I skipped over a slide. Talk about this one. Can healthcare, can healthcare be uh, 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 optimized uh, in a commodified marketplace? Here are the ethical and economic perspectives. Edmund Pellegrino, ethicist. Putting clinicians at risk can lead to loss of professionalism. Uh, market relationships rarely extend beyond the act of selling commodities, which has grave consequences in medicine. And only the government will place public good above private interest. Economist Kenneth Arrow concluded that uh, healthcare can't meet the conditions of a perfectly functioning market due, un due, due to uncertainty about the quality of products that patients purchase. An injury to some uh, caused by unconstrained markets may not be offset by benefit to others. Pellegrino and uh, ethicist, ethicist Daniel Callahan uh, conclude that uh, commodified healthcare is inherently unjust. Um, and among advanced economies, the freewheeling US market is perhaps the least efficient while producing poorer outcomes. So we, uh, so we come now to uh, healthcare and consciousness, which as I say, we need to solve commodification uh, it'll be, it's necessary, uh, but it won't be sufficient. We need to address consciousness as well because it is also a potent force in this. Clinicians who enjoy doing things that are concrete and short term and who have trouble saying no are not gonna limit care and change the system's priorities. Medical schools can't help but want to be generative and train more and more subspecialists, nor do they know how to break with their propensity for selecting students based on a narrowly defined vision of merit rather than on the basis of capacity to care. Corporate leaders lack the training uh, or interest in societal obligations. Patients who are run down by life in our society, who are isolated and need human contact, who have pain that is literal and figurative, who don't trust medical authorities from whom they are often socioculturally and racially distant, uh, and who are confused by misinformation about what medical science has to offer, look to medicine for a healing touch. Scientists who like to figure things out are mostly oblivious to societal problems and politicians love their moonshots and dramatic policy initiatives, uh, but don't want to offend constituencies that could drive them from office. So the discourse that emerges is very disappointing. 
doctors sell their procedures to their patients. Provider systems advertise miracles that they market. Professional societies guard their interests. Medical educators promulgate the values of the status quo. Scientists in the NIH make extravagant promises. Corporate speech induces demand and blocks progress. Politicians prefer moonshots to more mundane things they might be advocating. Uh, media sensationalize reports of scientific advances and rare, uh, rarely put them in perspective uh, or report much on the systemic problems in care. Health policy researchers rarely threaten the status quo and any public intellectuals trying to balance the discourse tend to be drowned out. Uh, Jürgen Habermas's theory of communicative action is relevant. We only have time to consider it briefly. But basically, he said that progress in society depends on common understanding of ends and the nature of interaction across four groups, those controlling capital and producing commodities, those who develop and implement policies, uh, individual groups seeking interpersonal influence, and the values and beliefs of members of society. And in general, capitalists communicate very well with policymakers, but other elements are shut out. In healthcare, the power rep rests largely with capital abetted by government and professional organizations. Absent common understanding, adversarial situations, such as malpractice suits, insurance denials, collection agencies, misdirected priorities in research, clinical programs, and medical education, and poor communication in clinical encounters uh, all ensue. The effect of all of this is a mess. Now, my PowerPoint skills are limited, and uh, we're not going to go through all of this. The arrows get lost one upon the other. Um, but it produces a set of relationships in which all the players tend to reinforce the worst instincts in all, in all of the other groups. And lurking over it is the ideology of corporations inducing demand and relentlessly extracting surplus revenue. And in the four quadrants are the scientists, the clinicians, the government, and the public. Far too often, all of them influence others in ways that tend to exacerbate problems rather than solve them. And all of these groups lose sight of the common good. So what is to be done? Policy change can't be sustained when almost every actor wants it to fail. A number of philosophers have written about the prospects for substantial change and have argued that just pulling a policy lever without addressing consciousness, uh, including values, attitudes, expectations, and perceived and unmet needs, will lead to failure in the end. And they're all worth reading. Uh, Lukash, Korsh, Gramsci, Marcuse, and we talked a little bit about Habermas, but we won't get into that today. But in healthcare, there are so many material goods at stake and so many non-material factors that mesh with the current arrangements that all of the groups of actors are more inclined to bear those ills we have than to fly to others that we know not of. Is meaningful change possible? So many actors are caught up in commodification of care, limited by their values and attitudes and perceived needs and uh, are promulgating or receiving problematic uh, communication. We've touched upon these various balloons, uh, uh, mostly in this talk. Academic organizations pursuing covered lives, government reluctant to raise taxes, nonprofit health systems maximizing surplus, educators using specialty trainees to increase revenue, insurers minimizing risk, and clinicians running the till, employers minimizing cost, and health system executives with seven-figure bonuses, scientists seeking the rewards of discovery and corporations inducing demand for products, students more interested in doing well than doing good, and trainees choosing high-paying high specialties, patients wanting their share of the goods, and investors seeking fast profits. At the same time, uh, the communication of biological reductionism in medical education, the discourse ignoring the ethos of science, corporate speech blocking reform, discourse mis misinforming patients about cost and effectiveness, media distortion of the implications of pub policy options, sensationalized reporting on scientific breakthroughs, 
discourse that ignores disparities, pharma uh, financing the FDA's drug approval process, uh, government and science scientists promising moonshots and cures, and consciousness, the atomization, loneliness, dissatisfaction with life, distrust of medical authorities, clinicians not trained to limit care, the negative socialization of students, the ethos of acquisition, the lack of a communal ethic, wanting more care and longer life, patient autonomy unbalanced by societal interests, docs preferring procedures to relationships, generative educators training too many specialists, and scientists caring about discovery rather than the common good. You need to, you need to take on a large number of challenges in this maelstrom of dimensions of commodification and communication in healthcare. Uh, as academicians, what can we do? Well, as educators, clinicians, and researchers, we should think strategically about how many of these problems we can take on in our own institutions and our own behavior. When there are so many barriers to progress, we can't ignore them all, and we can't highly restrict uh, the number of targets that we select for attention. The Senzo Camuccini's painting of the death of Caesar represents artistically our current conundrum in healthcare. It wouldn't have been enough to neutralize Cassius or Brutus or some other participant, analogous to the fervent opposition of actors in healthcare to the prospect of meaningful, substantial, broad reform. Everyone who greeted Caesar in Pompey's theater on the Ides of March wanted him dead. Changing policy won't be enough. Transformation needs to occur contemporaneously at the level of policy, consciousness, and communication and power relationships. Combination therapy is going to be needed and until that happens. Innovations like the Affordable Care Act, although representing a modicum of real progress, really are like treating lymphoma or HIV with one drug. They make a difference for some, uh, but will be undone by, uh, underlying, by the underlying malady. And uh, some of the uh, people who submitted questions in advance were wondering about uh, what marginal improvements are possible. Every marginal improvement is worthwhile, uh, but we need much more. Can we achieve justice and equity in just one sector of society, healthcare? We can hardly expect all actors in the healthcare system to embrace an egalitarian, communitarian, ethical, non commodified health sector when the rest of society is moving in a very different direction. But we shouldn't shy away from thinking boldly and broadly about what it will take to achieve justice for all in healthcare and in society. And it's imperative that we act both in our professional capacities and as, as citizens. And ac academicians have a special responsibility. And uh, you may have seen Don Berwick's JAMA article last week. He said the silence of health professionals is assent. At the very least, we can play an important role in evaluating potential solutions. Here are a few ideas, starting with medical education. Replace pre-medical science requirements with humanities, ethics, and social sciences, as Lewis Thomas suggested 40 years ago. Develop mechanisms to identify and select applicants driven by altruism, not prestige and income. Prioritize students who demonstrate capacity for empathy, psychological openness, sound and sound moral and ethical foundations, and sustained commitment to societal well-being. Allow members of underserved communities to nominate medical school matriculants. Ethics, morality, and social responsibility and communication skills should comprise up to half of the first two years of the medical school curriculum be integrated into clinical training which should consi consistently encourage psychological openness and give more weight to the social context of illness and less to biological reductionism. Pay doctors for their time, not for piecework. Specialty pay should differ modestly to account for differences in time and training. Incentivize clinicians to seek therapy to help them better understand and relation relate to patients, their needs and their values. All physicians should have periodic training in communication and negotiation with patients, ethics, morals, and social responsibilities. Mandate that procedural specialists and hospital administrators meet regularly to discuss strategies and set targets to reduce use, uh, use of low value care rather than the opposite. 
Don't pay health system CEOs salaries that are up to 50 times what some of their doctors earn and bonus payments to executives based on performance. Require full participation of all clinicians in Medicaid for health systems to maintain nonprofit status. Training and social responsibility in science should be core and substantial as a feature of scientific education. Revenue from inventions funded by federal grants should accrue largely to the government. Prioritize NIH research on bringing effective care to populations. Half the members of the advisory council of each NIH institute should be nominated by members of diverse communities affected by the disorders in their areas. Provide the same insurance coverage to everyone, single payer, separate, separate is never equal in health or in other parts of society. Approval of new treatments should, uh, um, should be contingent on ensuring that they're available to all and uh, should only occur after careful assessment of their marginal benefit and cost to society. The National Academy of Medicine should convene a panel to propose a revised set of budget priorities for the NIH that emphasize population health. Limit health system advertising to promotion of public health, not to selling their product lines. Stop overselling the implications of biomedical science. Stop selling patients procedures they don't need. Provide greater transparency about all medical prices, including what a doctor earns when they perform a procedure. Establish media standards for balanced reporting on the implications of new research. Provide social services to the public and patients and financial and psychological resources needed to address problems best dealt with in those ways. Educate patients and the public about the common good and fair distribution of limited medical resources. Offer clear communication about the limits of what medicine can accomplish. Train clinicians who can relate to effectively to diverse communities and incorporate communities into all levels of decision-making in research, education, and clinical care. So what will it take to change the trajectory of the US healthcare system and achieve justice for all? Change the consciousness of corporations, practitioners, and consumers, all of whom see it as a bundle of good, goods rather than a potential societal resource. Make it a priority to transform discourse about healthcare and relationships within healthcare. Pursue consensus that we are all in the same boat and should act accordingly. And don't give up with each failed effort at reform. As Rabbi Tarfan said two millennia ago, it is not your duty to finish the work, but neither are you at liberty to neglect it. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That was that was terrific, and um, it's uh, so um, such a large topic. And you know, as you said, you're really approaching this at at these high level goals. Um, I, I want to thank you also for joining us today and for taking the time to to speak with us. Um, I want to thank you for um, actually being my mentor at UCLA and being the first person to say that I should go as a, I believe it was second year resident to the Society of General Internal Medicine meeting, which I believe you sponsored for me um, many years ago. And, and I think that changed the trajectory of, of my career as well. And so um, being one of those, those people who uh, chose internal medicine, it, it, I, I thank you for that and, and for many lessons that you have um, given me, including today. Um, and I've been monitoring the chat a little bit uh, here, and I'm, I guess I'm going to summarize. Um, I'm going to summarize a, a few of the questions and, and a few of the questions that we got before. Um, and, and that's about change. Right? How how do we really go about doing the, these things? Those last few slides um, you presented are, are really um, remarkable because you had these very fine steps about what we need to do. But then that 
I think last slide, the one before this kind of said something like, we need to change the consciousness of um, corporate America, um, at least as it, as it involves healthcare. And that's a huge task, right? I mean, it, culture change, co consciousness change um, is a huge task. Um, if, if you were to pick one, two or three things that we could really do to, to now, to make a difference, um, what, would, what would you select? Um, I don't wanna pick one, two or three things. I think that uh, in a broad way, we need to change the kinds of people who are getting into medical school. At Cornell, you know, I work, I, I do a lot of work with uh, first with, with students, uh, helping them identify research projects to do. Um, so I meet a, a lot of the class. Uh, about 10 to 15 percent on day one know that they want to be orthopedic surgeons. And it's not that um, they have this intrinsic love of bones. I mean, it's pretty clear from the data that we know this is one of the highest paying specialties. And uh, yes, there are some of them who come in who have a certain kind of idealism, but it's pretty superficial and it's pretty easily stripped away as the opportunities to present themselves. I was talking with a, a student uh, who's applying for residencies this year uh, in primary care. And she told me, that students have been arguing with her throughout her career that, that, it, that, that she shouldn't go into that, that it's ridiculous to go into something like that when there are these other careers that you can pursue. So I think we need students who are genuinely altruistic, who are genuinely committed to society, who are, who are, who are clearly prepared to give of themselves uh, in a meaningful way. And the second kind of thing is we need to change the incentives in practice, both for um, uh, doctors, you know, so, so that it that it is not uh, a beneficial decision to the doctor to do a procedure as opposed to talking to the patient about it. And, um, uh, but also for the corporations, you know, certainly the um, uh, the insurance companies, the, the the hospitals, and and so on. Um, no, I, you're not going to change all the the consciousness of all the corporations in America. Although I would certainly say that to achieve true justice and equity and, and all will require society to change as well. And I think doctors can be like Rudolf Virchow, the great scientist and physician in Germany who, who said that medicine is a social science and joined the revolutionaries on the barricades in the Friedrichstrasse in 1848. Now, that didn't succeed, but that doesn't mean you don't try. Yeah, thank you. And, and there were a few comments about uh, that last quote from, from the rabbi as well as, as uh, being very meaningful. Um, we do have a uh, half an hour uh, or a little, maybe a little less than a half an hour for those who can stay for questions. Um, Martin, could you take down the, the stop sharing? Is, is that yeah, I was, I was just trying to emblazon in people all these, um, uh, <laughs> uh, these okay, tasks, great. right? <laughs> So um, if, if anybody has questions that they would like to um, verbalize, either things you put in the chat or things that you're thinking about, um, I, could you please um, raise your hand on the, um, on the Zoom? And um, in the meantime, while you all are thinking about that, I know some people have to drop off, but if you're able to stay for this conversation, that would be great. I do have um, another question while people are formal, um, formulating their thoughts, and that's about um, burnout. Um, so, you know, as now division chief of general medicine, oh, I'm sorry, now I see people asking questions. I'll save my question um, and I will um, call on Patricia Anderson, please, um, if you could ask your question. Thank you. I've been tracking the disability justice movement and their writings and work. Uh, and we're having I've trouble hearing you. An emerging... Oh, let me go slower. Okay. In corporate environments, reverse innovation is the idea that you go to the third world countries to discover 
how they solve a problem and that those solutions are more sustainable and usually more economically viable than anything we would create here in America. A parallel concept, you know, bringing the patients in is, has uh, something we've been doing in healthcare. And I've been finding in the disability justice movement that there's a great many proposals for things that sound like solutions to the problems you're describing. And so I wanted to just see if you had thoughts about that or if you were aware of some of the work being done in that area. I, ha I haven't been uh, uh, involved in that, but maybe you could share like some ideas that might be relevant. And, and if you could also just, uh, if everybody could introduce themselves very briefly when they're asking questions. So Dr. Shapiro knows who you are. Um, care work, mutual aid, um, collaborative community-based infrastructures for support. And um, there's, I will put in the chat the name of a person whose writing is particularly formative in this area, just as a place to start. Well, no, thank and you. I, um, and I'm Patricia yeah. Anderson. I'm the Emerging Technologies Informationist for the Health Sciences here at the University of Michigan. I, I do appreciate that, and uh, it sounds like an interesting consideration. We have to make sure if we do work in those that area, it's it's it amounts to more than rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Great, um, Sanjay. Yeah, hi, Martin. Thank you for this okay. really thought provoking talk. It's good to see you again. Thank you also for writing a letter of promotion when I went from assistant to associate. <laughs> Professor, I'm now full professor at Michigan. I'm also chief of medicine at VA Ann Arbor. And my question actually has to do with the VA. While we're part of government, you didn't call out the VA either as a problem or a solution. So I'm wondering where you would place the VA because much of what you describe, I completely agree with outside of the VA, but it doesn't have that doesn't have the same level of residence within the VA. CEOs of VA hospitals make about 220,000 dollars a year. No VA physician can make more than the president of the United States, which is capped at $400,000 a year. Um, while we don't take, a, take care of all Americans, we take care of all veterans. And the average income for our veterans is about $26,000. And they often are people who live in um, situations and, and settings that are very challenging for them. And so we're more than healthcare. We keep people in the hospital longer when they can't find another place to go. And we do that um, willingly. Um, so it's, for me, it really provides meaning. I think our learners see that as, as well. And so I'm wondering, is VA part of the problem or is VA maybe the solution or part of the solution? I would say, well, first of all, I think it's great that people choose to work there and earn less and take care of people with these broad problems, the often the wretched of the earth. Um, but um, I, so I don't think they're either the solution or the problem, but I think in some ways they continue to be a manifestation of the problem. Um, uh, if, if not in terms of commodification, then in terms of consciousness, certainly from what I hear from people who work in the VA, that getting things done can often be very difficult, uh, that many people put in their hours and not a minute more and, uh, and so on. And of course, we've heard of problems uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, quality in some VAs that um, uh, don't get addressed systemically. Some of it, of course, is the relative resources that are available there in relation to the needs of the population as opposed to say what a concierge doc Doc has, and so clearly there's something that could be addressed with money, uh, but the commitment to common, the commitment to the common good, uh, is probably uh, uh, you know there, there's a palpable pulse you know at the VA where there might not be say in the corporate suites of private hospitals, uh, yeah even university hospital CEOs make less than a lot of the private system CEOs it's true there are there is variation there. 
Um, I only had, you know, 50 minutes or so to make my uh, to make my case. Um, so I would say that the VA is is uh, a sign that some people care, uh, but there's still a lot more work to do. Great, thanks, Martin. Um, yes, thank you, um, Sumia. Run I'm sorry. Yeah, it's me, Somia Rangarajan. Um, uh, nice to meet you and great talk. Um, I'm a clinical assistant professor, relatively junior professor. I came out of um, fellowship in geriatrics and general medicine trained um, in 2017 and started as faculty then. Um, and my question's related to that. You talk a lot about the student pipeline and, and kind of improving the student pipeline, but I'm also wondering about the faculty pipeline because um, I just noticed in academic medicine, relatively junior faculty like myself, it's really hard to get uh, these faculty into academic medicine. I'll be honest, um, out of my residency class, um, I think only myself and one other person are still in academics out of a class of maybe 40 people in my internal medicine residency class. Everybody else went into private practice. Um, and um, actually it was uh, funny that uh, another colleague from a year above me <laughs> tried, you know, put me as um, a contact for, you know, possible promotion because I was literally the only person she knew from three residency classes who was still in academics. <laughs> and so um, I, I knew her somewhat, but not super well, but I was really the only person she could turn to who wasn't at her institution and still, still in academic medicine. And so, um, and so I was just wondering, you know, um, I think that may be part of the problem is that we don't have the mentorship as much anymore because we don't have the pipeline for younger physicians to come up the academic route. And I was wondering if you have any solutions to that. Well, um, it, it might well be that these people are going to private practice because they can make more money there, which of course is part of the problem because they don't have to uh, spend time teaching or taking care of Medicaid patients or whatever the, the issue might be. More sales in the private sector. Um, um, and that problem uh, isn't a problem in some of the large, larger metropolitan areas like New York, where most of the available positions are actually in academic health systems, which have taken over dozens of hospitals and practices and everything else. So, um, uh, so a lot of people end up supposedly in academics, but they're really, you know, practicing medicine and feeding the hospitals and the specialists for their procedures and so on. Uh, that also is the case in Los Angeles. Um, so it's partly an economic issue. Um, to some extent, it might well be a values issue uh, as well. I mean, what, is the, what does the student care about? Um, and and um, so I think, uh, but I think noting that uh, ought to be a, an important consideration for uh, your university. Uh, why do all our people go into private practice? You know, what, what are we missing? What aren't we doing? What could we do? Thank you. And uh, I see Megan with her hand up. Yes, uh, thanks so much, Dr. Shapiro. Uh, I'm one of the NCSP scholars. I will say that I'm probably in a uh, pinnacle problematic specialty of plastic surgery. Um, and I had two questions for you, um, kind of separate. Um, the first is you really talk about the commodification of healthcare. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment on the growth of private equity in the particip uh, in participation of healthcare systems and mm -hmm. how you see that kind of going along with your thesis and where you think it may go in the future. And then the second question um, kind of goes along the discussion we have been having, but, and I think Dr. Kerr was going to ask about this, but how do you think the role of burnout um, may play into the pipeline, especially for academics? Um, and this decision for trainees to go into private practice versus an academic profession. You know, I don't know how the burnout is, uh, you know, compares in academics versus the, the, the private sector. Um, uh, and there are a lot of people who've been studying that and it's an important consideration. There was that interesting op-ed in the New York Times uh, a few days ago by a doctor saying that the burnout is due to the corporatization of healthcare. And, you know, I think there's some truth in that. It's certainly not the whole answer. Um, um, I, I tell you, 
I find that there is great joy in relationships with patients. And you know, not being able to partake in relationships with patients for a variety of reasons, perhaps people don't have an incentive to do so, or because uh, they're emotionally incapable of that, um, uh, is, is a potential factor. Um, uh, as for the, uh, in, the investors, the, you know, I talked a little bit about that uh, in my talk. I think that as long as the incentives are uh, to uh, juice the system by, you know, by, by upscaling the alleged level of, you know, the visit uh, or by um, doing procedures when there's a choice not to do procedures, then people will be attracted to that as a way that they can figure out how to make a lot more money, you know, squeeze more money uh, out, of a, out of a system that's providing care. And so changing those incentives could help a lot. Great. Thank you. Uh, David. Yeah, I'm just trying to get my camera show it working here. Is it working? Yes. Yeah, so I'm Dave Stevens, and I'm a hospitals and internist here. Um, probably more of a country doctor than an academic, um, but I'm 100% clinical. Um, one of the reasons why I've stayed at Michigan is that our group is actually protected, that we only have 11 patients within missions, maybe a couple more per day. But talking to colleagues who say worked for a decade in community practice in hospital medicine, they don't make, they don't pay their bills. They're not even paying themselves until they've seen 18 to 20 patients a day. Um, and I think that probably has a lot to do with some kind of burnout, right? And I see patients who say, you know, oh, the doctor never talked to us like this before. Well, it's like, well, I'm actually subsidized so I can talk to people. If I was working at a community practice and I was seeing 25 medicine inpatients a day, um, actually this colleague was telling me when they had new faculty, they actually taught them how to avoid talking to patients and their families because that was lost money. And they're paying themselves. They don't have a salary. So I think that the difference between um, private and community and academic practice. Um, but you also said we have to avoid commodification, but isn't also talking about relative valuation of treatments, a form of commodification. How can we talk about when is it appropriate to stop ICU care? if we're not talking about risks and benefits and commodification and costs to society. No, I, I completely agree with you on this issue. And, and hospitalists, they're not the lowest of the low. They're not quite down there with, uh, with uh, primary care docs and endocrinologists and ID docs, but they're relatively low. Dermatologists work far fewer hours than most other doctors and make a lot more than many other doctors. And, um, and it isn't because they're you know, sitting and talking to patients about their feelings and needs and yeah. the social context of illness. Um, uh, I think that uh, if the pay were, if, if we were paying people for their time, people could spend the time taking care of patients. And if you pay everyone for their time, even scrubbing in and scrubbing out and dictating your surgical note, um, there'd still be a lot more time and a lot more support for the ambulatory docs and for the hospitalists who are in a position where they can benefit patients greatly by talking to them at length about what's going on. And some of the people who do procedures, uh, they ought to spend time talking to patients too and let them be paid as much as for the time they spend as for the time they spend doing procedures. Thank you. Um, any other questions from, from the group? Um, I'll, I'll just extend Megan's question a little bit on, on burnout or maybe just a comment. Um, and I completely agree with you, Martin, that, that burnout is, is multifactorial and it has to be approached in many different ways, including, you know, as you've been talking to kind of the, the balance of of the work required and the time available to do it and the resources available to do it. 
Um, some people talk about burnout as moral injury. And I think that one of the things that what, what you're speaking to is that, um, and, and David spoke to this as well, that sometimes, uh, many times what we see are physicians who are committed, who are still idealistic in many ways, who want to spend that time with uh, their patients and they're prevented from doing so it, because of the reality of the workload. Um, and so they aren't meeting even their own standards. Um, and and that, that contributes to their feelings of, of burnout. Um, I think that, you know, and maybe you could comment if some of the solutions that you see to the healthcare system might also be solutions to the huge burnout problem we're having among physicians. Yeah, I think um, the systems I've been around, you know, a doctor who, you know, spends more time with their patients generates fewer RVUs and it makes other people unhappy and it makes them feel stressed. Um, but it's also stressful not to talk to your patient when they need to talk to you. <laughs> now, of course, there are these patients who are endless vats of need, and one has to be able to circumscribe that in some way. And I certainly talked about the other kinds of resources that, that that's, ought to be more available to people, something that the VA tries to do. Um, but um, it's, um, um, it's a big challenge to figure it all out. Um, uh, you know, so sometimes burnout can be depression and physicians often are reluctant to get treated for their uh, emotional problems. Sometimes burnout is hating your patients. <laughs> sometimes is uh, there's so much reward for doing so many procedures that you're doing too many procedures and spending too much time and working too hard. I mean, there's, there's all these things. And uh, yeah, as uh, Eve, I think you're right. I mean, it's it's multifactorial. It's not a simple solution, but lots of the problems that are problems of the system are also problems that potentially could be contributing to burnout. But burnout isn't the only thing we need to deal with. You know, we have a country uh, which is sliding behind the advanced world in terms of life expectancy. I remember reading an article in the New York Review of Books in the uh, 1980s, talked about declining life expectancy in the Soviet Union. I was shocked, and it seemed like. It, it indicated that it would be an imminent collapse of that country. And of course it was, or a symptom of that. Well, you know, we, we, we've got to do a lot better with our trillions uh, that are going for healthcare. And we've got to think about how we can help everyone and, and, and not cause doctors, some doctors to feel like they're the kings of the world or the queens of the world or whatever you, you call people in this, uh, non-binary world um, uh, because they make a lot of money doing a lot of procedures and other people feel like they're accessories. Well, um, I uh, really appreciate um, just hearing your perspective on um, both the problems and the solutions. I know many will be interested in, in your book. I did put the link in the chat. I, I think you told me that there's a discount available too. And if you could maybe send that information to, um, to Stacy at, at IHPI, um, she can get that out to everybody who... Yeah. Uh, I mean, for, for bulk discounts, it's a lot. I mean, it's, the book is paperback, so it's not even that expensive. But I'll send her the information on getting, uh, on getting a discount if you order directly from Johns Hopkins. Okay. But, that um, um, right. Yeah, I, I hope people will read it and will seriously uh, engage the issues and challenge some of the outrageous things that I say. And mm -hmm. the proposals that I put up at the end, I call them quixotic uh, proposals. <laughs> because I, I understand that it is, it is not imminent that all this will happen. When I, when I was a, a youngster, a, a medical student, I did an elective with the government of Manitoba where I grew up and they had a social democratic government that was trying to create a unified health system. And the local uh, Catholic hospital was refusing to play ball with them. And so I was at a meeting where three of these cabinet ministers were, uh, talking about the problem. I was working with the deputy minister of health and, um, and they were trying to figure out what to do. And so I said, 
why don't you just dissolve the board of that hospital and create a unified system? So this old socialist minister of labor who was running the meeting turned to me and said, son, the board of that hospital is going to be around long after you're dead. <laughs> and and uh, so far, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm still hoping for immortality, but I, I suspect <laughs> he was right. <laughs> Well, well, with that, uh, we we very much appreciate your your talk and your perspectives, Rod. Any any? Uh... Oh, I'm just so appreciative. Yeah. And uh, um, and we hope to see you in person. And uh, it would be it would be great to be there in person. And um, uh, although I don't want to go to the big house, you know, I mean, I, I can't deal with that. <laughs> your your pack eight. 10, 12 thing, get over it. <laughs> you know, Rod, when Rod moved to Michigan, I said, are you going to pull for uh, University of Michigan? He said, no, I'm a PAC, uh, I'm a PAC 8 guy or whatever it was in those days. And PAC 10 when I went. PAC 10 when you left and it looks like you got over it. Well, no, I Michigan, then PAC, whatever it is now, PAC 12 <laughs> and shrinking. 12 and shrinking yeah absolutely yeah. no no that's that's okay uh -huh. uh, but i won't for, for ucla i went to cal i know you did um yeah uh so um yeah anyways it, but it's wonderful to see uh, all of you and look we, promise we won't take you to the big house but we we hope we'll see you here in person and in, in yes <laughs> so that would be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep on struggling to create a better healthcare system. I see Larry down. Larry there as well. <laughs> uh, and um, and um, you know, we'll 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 fight on, and uh, you know, um, maybe we can make it better. Yeah. Great. Price of freedom is <sighs> eternal vigilance. Uh huh. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Come on, buy it, buy it. Yes, <laughs> okay, Thank you okay. so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Everybody. Wonderful talk. Thank Bye -bye. You.